my name is Shelley Wright. I want to share my experience as a patient in the complaint system of the Royal United Hospital in Bath, England. My complaint arose as a result of me experiencing a cardiac arrest through blood loss on the 13th of November 2017. I suffered a whole hour of terror as I bled before I collapsed despite alerting staff and ended up in intensive care. I want to say what it feels like to be a patient, especially when things are not handled well. Hopefully this trust and staff from other trusts who are watching this will think about what I'm saying and make the journey of every patient who comes through their system easier, less stressful, believable and with proper answers and closure. I know some of this may seem trivial to you, but it had a cumulative effect. Have any of you thought about what happens to your patient after you feel you've finished with a complaint? Firstly, not everyone wants to sue you. Most patients just want honesty and closure. My complaint was, and still is, not about money. And everyone involved has known this from the start. I loathe the compensation culture. It achieves nothing. It was a huge effort for me to make the complaint, but I thought the incident was too serious to ignore and I didn't want another patient to go through what I had endured and I wanted other patients to be safe. Even before the meeting, I was deeply traumatised by the incident. From raising the complaint to the first meeting took eight weeks. This was an eternity. Yes, you need to get statements from everyone, but why did it have to take so long? I had a call from the Director of Nursing who asked me to attend the meeting, as it's really powerful for those involved to see and feel how it felt. During our conversation, I was sobbing and already clearly displaying and discuss discussing symptoms of PTSD. I told her of my nightmares and the flashbacks. She made no effort to act on this. During these weeks, I was also in contact with my clinical nurse specialist both on the phone and in person. Again, I was clearly displaying and discussing signs of PTSD and she also did nothing. I had to endure a further six months of outpatient treatment and no one thought to refer me for psychological care or to offer my transfer of care to another hospital, which would have been easy at the beginning. I understand that all of the staff involved were traumatised by the event and immediately had psychological care. Debriefings, meetings, colleague and management support. Why on earth did no one think that if staff were so traumatised by an event, the patient caught up in it would also be traumatised and need help? Why is there no system in place to care for the patient? Fortunately, just before the first meeting, I had an outpatient appointment and they realised what was happening and immediately emailed the trust psychologist and got me an appointment with him. It was that easy. The key to good recovery from PTSD is early referral. In preparation for the first meeting, I spent a long time writing down questions that I needed answers to. When the day of the meeting arrived, it was hugely upsetting, even being in the hospital. Bearing in mind most of my trauma happened in an anaesthetic room with an anaesthetist, the meeting was held in the anaesthetic department. Who thought that up? Of all the rooms in the hospital, why did it have to be there? When I walked into the room with just my partner for support, there was a huge table with all the managers on one side and seats for us on the other. Immediately, a huge barrier had been put up. I also noted straight away that no one from the original incident was there. Firstly, what would be the point of the meeting? And secondly, I felt I'd been lied to and so was already on edge. As far as I'm aware, complaints meetings are supposed to be completely truthful and a way to resolve issues to the patient's satisfaction. I was naive enough to think this would happen. As soon as the first person was untruthful, and the patient is aware of that, the whole meeting loses its credibility and never recovers. This is not just about speaking untruthfully, it's about omitting what you know 
and about sitting there knowing another member of staff is being untruthful and not intervening. All three of these situations occurred during this meeting. Can you imagine how that felt? I was both boiling with anger and incredibly sad. No one was being an advocate for the patient. It was bad enough doing this to me as a patient, but they all knew I was a colleague. I was devastated. It's not just about having the most senior staff at a meeting. It's about having people who are credible, who genuinely want to solve the problem and were present at the time of the incident. The chair was dishonest, disrespectful and dismissive of things I said. Even when I challenged him, he continued in the same vein. Although in a later second meeting, the director of nursing said she did not know the anaesthetist was on leave, she knew that the nurse would not be attending because of her pay grade. With no one there from the original incident, I could not get the basic answers to, why did you let this happen? I continued with the meeting, knowing that I had to end it and then go and request my medical records. I cannot convey to you the sense of betrayal I felt. During the meeting, I asked each question slowly and individually and waited for an answer before asking the next one. My partner, who's not a skilled note taker, managed to write everything down word for word. The trust had their own trained note taker. Throughout the whole meeting, she never once said she could not keep up. Two weeks later, I was given the letter with a transcript from this first meeting. I was horrified to find it was littered with errors and omissions. It was at best a pricey and at worst untruthful. If it had been correctly transcribed, I would have no trouble now proving the anaesthetic chart was not in its original form. Also, these notes contained an addendum which showed that when the meeting was ending and I was no longer in the room, they had all had a discussion and added something else which I had not been party to and was not allowed to challenge. This cannot possibly be right. I immediately wrote to the head of complaints with all our corrections and observations. The reply given by email was, yes, noted, on file. This is just not good enough. I then requested my medical notes and despite being told by PALS that I could have them by the end of the week, I still have the email saying this, it was two weeks before I was allowed to see them. It does not need to take this long. Medical records are there and should be available. There was no objection from my surgeon. All this did was add to my anger and now my growing suspicion. Throughout this whole time, I was still having to attend outpatient appointments in a place where I no longer felt safe and I trusted nobody. I tried getting some advocacy help through PALS, but as I'm neither elderly nor disabled, I could not access this. On the day I finally got my records, both the head of complaints and the head of medical records were present. I was horrified to find the anaesthetic chart was no longer in its original form. I immediately informed both and to this day, neither has acted on it. Also, all of my electronic records were missing. Do you not think they would have had the courtesy after two weeks of me waiting to make sure they had everything in order? As I was already deeply suspicious, this just added to it. It could have been a genuine mistake. And if I had been a patient with no knowledge of paperwork, there should have been, I would probably just have accepted what had been put in front of me. But actually I was, and am, a hugely experienced nurse now working in ED, but with theatre, surgical and surgical admissions experience. And I knew the electronic records would all have times on where I could prove what I was saying. Was it just an oversight that they were missing or deliberate? I had to wait 48 hours to see these missing records. All of the electronic records were vital because they have times on. Times of when you enter and leave a department and times of blood transfusions. And if I had not had my nursing background, I probably would not have known this. This is incredibly destructive for someone who is already fragile from the event itself. 
All the time, these seemingly minor events were adding to my distrust and stress levels. All this time I had no support from the trust. I was just left completely alone. It was an incredibly lonely place to be. I was horrified to find in my notes that the nurse on the admissions ward had written nothing about the entire event and the anaesthetist had also written nothing about the escalation, that I told her I was bleeding badly and that the bloody pad had been discarded without being mentioned. The discharge letter to my GP written by my surgeon is untruthful and different to my discharge letter. If I had not requested my medical records, I would not have seen this or known about it. So now I had to request a second meeting in order to get answers raised by the first meeting and I struggled to get it. Why? If a patient still has concerns, these should be addressed. In the end, I had to send a letter to the CEO and to my MP to ask for their help. This should not have been the case. The second meeting was held in the same place as the first and was this time recorded as I had said I would not accept the same note taker. I feel all meetings should be recorded. It gives protection to everybody. If notes were properly transcribed, I would have no problems now proving what was said in the first meeting. When I brought the fact up to the first meeting's notes were not accurate, the director of nursing said they were just supposed to be an overview. They are not supposed to be an overview. They are supposed to be a true and accurate record. I have brought all the above points about my medical records within the second meeting and to date nothing has been done about them. Walls of silence are not helpful and they breed suspicion. Don't you think when a patient has just completed a first meeting then ask for medical records and a second meeting that someone would realise that issues had not been resolved? I know a lot of complaints just need a phone call or a letter of apology but some are really serious and prolonged. Why is there no one within the hospital complaint system to act as liaison to assist a patient? All I got were emails telling me where and when meetings were going to be. Why can people only get support if they can afford a solicitor? Who can afford one? While staff involved have managers, unions, trust solicitors, the patient stands alone. I want all of you to know how lonely isolated and powerless I felt. All I want is truthful answers, closure and things put in place by all departments to make sure this doesn't happen to another patient. Anyone could have intervened on my behalf but everyone chose not to. Throughout this whole time people involved either directly or indirectly and who know the answers have watched me deteriorate mentally and then drastically, physically deteriorate without intervening. And this I do not understand. I was 95 kilos on my day of surgery and a year later I was 54 kilograms and a tired, angry and miserable bag of bones. It does not help that my surgeon will tell me some of what happened in private, but he will not stand up and speak out. My understanding of why patients sue the NHS is firstly there was no proper apology and secondly because there's a belief there is a cover-up. Although I did receive a managerial apology, no one from the original event has ever apologised either in person or by letter. Is it surprising that the NHS so frequently gets sued? Do any of you think about what happens to your patients afterwards? What about follow-up? In the emergency department I worked in, all trauma patients are followed up, initially by us, and the families of people who have died in the department are also followed up by us to see if we can offer any support and also to give closure and answers. Why is there no support in this trust? Over a year later, I was still receiving psychological support and struggling to work in the NHS where my whole belief system has been destroyed. Does anybody in this trust believe they have done a good job? Why does anyone want to leave a patient in this state? You might say I was so distressed I was mistaken, but actually I might be completely right. I have asked people on the periphery, have I got this wrong at all? They just stare at me in silence. Still no closure 
no transparency, no answers. Sometimes you just have to accept that staff just haven't had a good day. Everyone is human. It's better to admit this than to hide behind walls of silence. During this whole process, I've seen staff cared for, supported and protected by the staff. No one has shown any care, support, love, advocacy or compassion to the patient. I want you to know how lonely, isolated and powerless it feels to be a patient. Whichever trust you work for, please do not let this happen to anyone again. It is one thing to give a patient PTSD when you do not mean to. It's another thing to leave them with it by being untruthful and not allowing closure.